Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this issue briefing. I'm Oliver Kahn. I work at the World Economic Forum. This one is on the new great game. A little bit of context here, of course. The great game of the 19th century was a political power struggle and a military power struggle between the great powers of the day, Britain and Russia, mainly played out in Central Asia. So we're not trying to intimate there's something similar happening right today. But the purpose of these issue briefings is some of you will, uh, that, that join us regularly in this room is to look at areas that aren't covered on the public program, maybe areas and um, issues and, 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 and topics that are just becoming into the public consciousness, things that we should be perhaps thinking about a little bit. It's only quite recent that the World Economic Forum has been covering defence and security in its annual meeting in quite such depth. There have been already some high-profile sessions on uh, the future of warfare and uh, sexy subjects such as autonomous weapons and, and 3D printed drones have already, already been taking headlines. So we're not going to go there. But what we're going to hopefully discuss is what are the new theatres of war potentially in the future? What are we least prepared for? What do we need to do to prevent, prevent our great global commons? I'm thinking here mainly the deep ocean, cyberspace, space, safe and secure in the near and hopefully long term future. Great panel, very, very expert and well um, and, and, and well experienced on this subject. Um, first, um, Her Excellency was Janine Hennis Pleshut, of course, the Minister of Defence of the Netherlands, I believe a member of our Global Future Council as well. Um, a great collaborator of ours and again very happy to be joined by Admiral James Stavridis, Dean of Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University in Boston. Of course, uh, prior to that a, a Navy commander and also a commander in NATO. Um, outside of the U.S. Armed Forces. Um, Minister Ple Hennis Pleshart, I'm going to start with you by asking whether, simply, we are facing an environment where we are in a, you know, the early stages of a new great game, the great powers of the world cooperating in other areas, such as trade and, and perhaps climate change and other issues, but you know, tensions fraying around the edges and competition in these uncharted and often invisible commons um, tensions on the rise? Well, tensions are on the rise, um, I guess. We all feel it, we can see it, we can experience in Ukraine, in the MENA region, um, but also in cyberspace, for example. It's a new phenomenon and it's deeply disturbing. Now, you refer to the great game, which I like in a way because it's also history indeed between Britain and Russia, um, but um, some, some call it the return of geopolitics. The um, fact is that the kind of exceptional unipolar moment is over and that we uh, enter a new era. Um, a big difference though with the 19th century I would say is that nowadays we, um, there is this huge array of actors, empowered individuals, mega cities, um, um, civil and military, um, so it's a completely different picture from what we witnessed in the 19th century and we will have to deal with it. But it makes the world more complex and more contested. And, and the obvious question to ask is how do you plan for a, uh, such, a, such a wide and diverse array of potential actors? Well, first of all, there is, um, we have to understand as we are dealing with such a huge array of actors that is not there for, 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 for what we are witnessing right now. There is no, not just a military solution. So it's always a combination of civil and military and that we have to inter, um, create the right interaction between all uh, the relevant stakeholders. And we also have to take into account, for example, the pace of developments. It's completely different from the 19th century and that obviously has to do with, um, uh, with for example, uh, cyberspace. And we also have to take into account the dissemination of knowledge. It's not just states, but it's also, again, empowered individuals um, and even, you know, um, uh, individuals that do not have the best uh, interest with us or for us, uh, they have access to this um, uh, knowledge and technological information. And a, and a final question before we come to the Admiral, and then we'll have, we'll open this up and just to say we try to keep these sessions as interactive as possible. We don't have long, we have a lot of information to cover, but as a defence minister, how much of your time is taken up on these new theatres, these, these new ways of dealing with, 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 with tensions, the new actors, compared to traditional conventional warfare, if you will? Well, cyberspace, I mean, many of us talk about the hybrid threat nowadays. 
like it's a new phenomenon, it's not. But cyber is a new phenomenon. And we're at the beginning of, you know, trying to, under, or of understanding how to deal with it. So it's not yet governed with clear rules and norms and standards, and the international community is working on it. And it's going to be crucial, not just for states, but also for the private sector and all the other actors, that we understand what kind of norms and standards we uh, find acceptable um, for cyberspace. But again, we're at the beginning, and thereby we run the risk of, um, of cyberspace developing into a true battle space. And I'm, I'm seriously concerned about that. And I want to come back to the, the point you made about international cooperation, because one would be uh, tempted to you know, be slightly concerned by the fact that you, the, the same people who are, who are creating the tension and, and ra ratcheting up the, uh, the temperature, as it were, are the same people that need to cooperate, to, to put in place the standards and the correct, the correct governance systems to, to make things safe. So maybe let's come back to that. But Admiral, I'd like to know what keeps you up at night. Well, I was often asked that question when I was a Supreme Allied Commander at NATO, and uh, the candidates would have been Afghanistan, Libya, the Balkans, Syria, piracy, NATO reform. There were plenty of candidates, but the thing that kept me awake at night was, in fact, cybersecurity. And the reason is because of the mismatch between the level of threat and the level of preparation. In other words, in dealing with terrorism, pretty, pretty significant threat, but we're actually quite ready to deal with it. Uh, Counter-piracy, uh, a threat, but we're ready to deal with it. Cyber, we have not done the basics yet. The minister is exactly right. We're at the very beginning with this. So cyber continues to be the focus of much of my research. And I would say your point about international cooperation, we have got to wrench cyberspace out of the great game and make it not a zone of conflict, which is where we are trending, but make it a zone of cooperation. I would add another place into this list, and that is the Arctic. As we see global warming, melting the polar ice caps, shipping lanes opening, hydrocarbons in dispute, uh, Russia on one side, five NATO nations on the other side, that's another area we need to avoid turning into a zone of conflict. Let's make it a zone of cooperation. And you're researching cyber as well, so the question begs to me that we don't, it isn't new, and we've been talking about it for quite a while, and especially here at the Forum in our Global Risks Report, it, is, it isn't new. The, America suffered a massive outage last year. Um, we were talking last week, in fact, when we launched our Global Risks for 2017, that the number one business threat is in, in, in the USA last year, the one region of the world was cyber, and now it's every single region of the world. So that's just business. We're not even talking about security. I'm curious why no more progress has been made already and, and, and where you think the progress is, is being made right now, where the focus is on. At the moment, the focus in cyber has been on defense and trying to create a perimeter defense. Offense, because it can generate more power at the point of impact, has been able to overcome that. That's why we see uh, Home Depot in the United States, 60 million accounts. Then Chase Manhattan Bank, 87 million accounts. Yahoo, 500 million accounts. That's because offense is overcoming defense. What we need to do is come up with a new defensive approach that doesn't only focus on the perimeter, but goes inside the cyber system to split the data, only reassemble it at point of use, and thus create, if you will, internal antibodies, as well as maintaining that perimeter defense, A, and B, nation on nation, we need to evolve a regime of deterrence. Much as we have with nuclear weapons, these are powerful tools we need to ensure nations think of them in that light and gradually create deterrent regimes. How many countries are doing this, engaged in cyber warfare right now? I'd say there are 20 nations in the top tier of cyber, cyber development with some focus on military application. So this is not out of 200 nations. This is not uh, a huge phenomenon. On the other hand, only about a dozen countries have nuclear weapons. We need to be thinking about this in that context going forward. It's that serious. Let's just say, get an idea if he wants to ask questions on the floor. Do raise your hand. 
gentleman there, let's, let's, let's get the microphone, please. And if you could remind us where you're from and your name, please. Sure. Uh, Doug McCauley. I'm a professor of marine science at University of California, Santa Barbara. You mentioned the Arctic and, and some of the conflict or the uh, challenges that we're facing up there. Could, could either of you map out a pathway to success in the Arctic either, or perhaps both, economic success and collaboration and environmental success and collaboration? Yeah, Doug, I'm sure you're familiar with the other end of the Earth, which is Antarctica. I think uh, a good starting point would be to look at how Antarctica has been developed in international law, how different countries are operating there. Uh, we have medical diplomacy, science diplomacy. We have very cooperative aspects of all that in Antarctica. We ought to look at that as a model, think about how that can be applied in the high north. We should also convene a summit, I think, of the leaders of the Arctic nations. Um, there's never been such a summit. Now would be a good time to do that. New administration coming in. And then thirdly, I think there is a role here for the United Nations to think about this as a, a zone of cooperation, develop a program. It's also something I think the World Economic Forum could take on. So there are some models, there are some pathways. If we do nothing, it will drift toward a military yeah. solution. I fully agree, um, I fully agree. I, I, the previous sec, um, uh, sec of uh, Chuck Hale yes. actually uh, made a uh, very interesting point out of it in, during a Halifax conference Correct. In, uh, in Canada. And he was absolutely right at the time. Now time is running, so we have to speed up. And I think all of us here agree that international law and jurisdiction is the best way for you know peace, peaceful settlement of possible disputes or whatsoever. So I fully agree with the, uh, with the Admiral. And we have to, to deal with it, not just with the Arctic nations, but with many more, because there are so many interests at stake, so we should feel as an international community, we should feel ownership and definitely um, also address it within the UN. Just to add a point to that, uh, China, for example, which is certainly not an Arctic country, yeah. operates a significant fleet of icebreakers. Yeah. They have more than the United States has. Um, so there's, I think, a real global interest in the Arctic and moving it toward a zone of cooperation. Which is interesting because the Arctic nations are often um, called out for their success in managing, managing to maintain good relationships despite the strategic rivalries that they could succumb to. Right. What's changed, I think, is the level of tension between Russia and the NATO countries. We need to do everything we can to avoid a bleed over of the NATO-Russian tension that exists in Eastern Europe, for example, into the high north. And that's so important that we continue the dialogue with Russia. But it's a different panel, I guess. But, uh, but, but it's very tempting not to speak with each other. Yep. But we have to continue a open dialogue. I mean, be clear about what you like or don't like. Yep. But you have to continue speaking with each other. Well, nobody at the World Economic Forum is going to say dialogue is not a, not a good thing. So, <laughs> so we're, you know, we're, we're known for that. Um, let's get back onto international cooperation then, because it's something you've touched on. And what are the structures that are working well at the moment and, and where do we need to just start again, start from scratch? What do you mean with you? In, in, terms, of, to in terms of governance structures, is, is, are, are things working? Um, uh, we're so right at the start of, 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 of putting yeah. in place structures for various threats, but is anything working well? Are there any areas where we just need to you know, re rethink the way we, we cooperate together? We also, I mean, the world is changing, so you also have to re the, rethink your structures. At the very same time, and we touched upon it several times during uh, these days here in Davos, is that we live in a multi-layered world order. Um, and we need our multinational institutions. So I cannot imagine a world without a UN or a NATO or a European Union. Um, uh, but we have to empower them. And we also have to realize that those institutions are as strong as uh, their member states. So we have many member states right now, UN, NATO, or European Union, they're facing or a kind of a crisis or or running a narrow-minded national ag uh, agenda, and that clearly has an impact on the effectiveness of our multinational institutions. Um, but um, uh, as the world is changing, we obviously ha have to adapt our, 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 our multinational institutions or to empower them in a different way, uh, but we should not give up on them. They, they, are, they guide us and they will help us. 
I agree with all that. I'll add a kind of a, a practical example of a regime that I think has done very well, and it's the International United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, if you think back to the late 1970s, there was no agreement on the size of territorial seas. There were major disputes because some nations were claiming 200-mile territorial seas. Others had a traditional three miles, some took 12. It was extremely chaotic. Um, over the course of a decade, the international community negotiated this, I think, quite brilliant treaty that has been ratified by almost every country. I'm sorry to say the United States has not, although we follow the conventions of it. It's a good example of taking uh, action as an international community in the global commons and creating at least some sense of order. We need to be thinking along those lines in cyberspace. Definitely. The UN Convention, Love the Sea, is a perfect example and should be applied in different domains. Uh, also, maybe later on in outer space. You never know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's, just, let's talk. Let's move away from cyberspace and talk about space. Um, I mean, this is probably not one of your areas of specialism, but Admiral, I know you've written on the subject of space warfare. There, what are the um, what are the main threats that we see, and, and how well do you think they're being mitigated currently? In in space. In space, I think that space. I'll give you th in, space. in outer space, outer right? Space. Um, I think but there are. I think there are probably three significant things that are at risk in, uh, if you will, outer space. One is um, the growing number of debris fields that are there, which create uh, real dangers. Secondly, the increasing uh, highly classified programs that are designed against satellites, which would deeply impact the international system. And then thirdly, and this is a kind of two-edged sword, but it's the increase of private sector activity into outer space. Um, who's regulating that? How is that being managed? Uh, space is a global commons. It's infinite. Um, we're not going to ever manage it the way we manage the oceans, but we need a better norms and a better regime because of the increasing anarchy in that space. Any questions? Okay, let's talk about technology because we are still at the beginning of the fourth industrial revolution. If you um, agree with the World Economic Forum's worldview, what technological advances are, have the potential to have the greatest impact on the way we cooperate or don't in these areas? I would I would argue the 21st century in the end will not be about cyber or info or the maritime world. The 21st century, I think, will go down in human history as the age of biology, and the ability to sequence the human genome, the price of which is falling very very rapidly, will allow us to do vastly advanced immunotherapies, ultimately alter our DNA, uh, potentially expand human life in a temporal sense, living longer, uh, correct diseases, change features. They may even be able to give me hair, which would be a powerful, <laughs> powerful thing. So I think there's um, going to be dramatic changes ahead as a result of biology. That's kind of the good news. The bad yeah. news is we ought to be much more worried about pandemics than we are. If you go back 100 years ago, Spanish influenza infects 40% of the world's population with a mortality rate of 20%. Every 100 years in human history, there's been a significant pandemic. We are due. So I think biology will be a shock to us over the next decade or so, in some good ways and in some less good ways. To, to the extent where defense people, such as yourselves, need to be worrying about it rather than scientists, health, health experts, ministers. Yeah, that's why health ministers and defense ministers are more and more getting together and working um, together on how to um, uh, to counter or how to deal with an issue such as described by uh, the Admiral. And do you um, agree, Minister, that biology is the biggest technological? Uh, the biggest, I don't know, but it's going to be uh, enormous. And um, But also, for example, I guess that the relation between us and a machine is going to be uh, a, you know, a challenge uh, and and uh, for the years to come. So, so I agree with the admiral. But to to say to to name it right now as the biggest, it's I don't yeah, know. Let me let me pick up a thought here, which is 
it really is the merger of these two things of bio and information. This is Ray Kurzweil's mm-hmm. book, The Singularity is Near. What he's talking about is this merger of biology, technology, information, artificial intelligence. Excellent. I think yeah. the minister's right to add a little shading around the bio piece of it. But I think the bio piece is going to surprise us more than anything else. Okay, well, in the absence of any more questions, one final one from me, um, which I always like to ask is, what is your, what is top of your mind for the coming year? What's your one big priority when it comes to this particular area of discussion? What would you like to see achieved or what are you going to put, de- devote most of your energy into? The coming year? Yes, in the coming year. So 12 months time? 12 months. Um, we can talk longer out if you okay, think Okay, I'm a more, politician, right? So apt. we have elections coming up? Okay, <laughs> let's talk six months. No, then. I'm teasing you. There's, no, don't worry, I'm joking. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, no, cyber, I think that, that, that well, there are many things that's very difficult to prioritize right now. But the coming 12 months within NATO, as well as within the EU, cyber is going to uh, take a lot of my time. I think cyber will be crucially important. I think a second thing that I hope uh, the U.S. government and our European partners will be working on is great power relationships. Um, In other words, how do we find more zones of cooperation with the Russian Federation? How do we avoid, we the United States, avoid a trade war with China? Um, How do we peacefully settle our arguments and disputes about the South China Sea? What will India's role be in all of this? So I guess we can conclude where we started on the great game. I think that uh, great power relationships are going to be the strategic motif. And I think over the next 12 months, because of the new U.S. administration, it will be a very significant 12 months. And I agree with the minister in terms of cyber will play in the background on all of this because they will all, all of those nations are in the cyber game. No, but, but he's absolutely, I'm sorry, I have to, 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 to say this because you're absolutely right. The coming 12 months, clearly, I mean, I was more or less as a defense minister, I will deal with cyberspace as a priority. But as I just said, we, I mean, we left the exceptional moment of an unipolar world. So the governance worldwide of a multipolar world, we're slowly moving towards it, that it's going to be crucial. So let's just, just dwell on that. Very, very briefly. Um, the greatest dynamic, of course, is going to be the US and Russia, I think. But what are the other dynamics that we need to be aware of in terms of the relationships between major powers? I think South US China and sea. China, yeah, yeah, South China Sea. Yeah. US China has got this sort of tactical irritant of the South China Sea. Yeah. It has a strategic uh, over piece of it now that the US has walked away from the Trans Pacific Partnership. Big mistake. And it has uh, a kind of a Uh, nation-on-nation economic component in the kind of sword rattling of of high tariffs on China by uh, President-elect Trump. There's plenty to work out between the United States and China. And and clearly the fight against ISIL will continue. And and what about the EU in all this? What's 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 the EU's place as as, um, other power relationships get formed around the world? Well, one of the key questions um, in the months to come is whether the European nations will be able to uphold their own in a very competing world. Now, um, I think that the EU managed to make some progress the last few years, but um, clearly we also suffered some setback with the prospect of the UK leaving the EU. Um, Obviously, the Brexit dust will have to settle down. Uh, Theresa May made her uh, ideas about a clear Brexit um, uh, known to us earlier today, but also earlier this week. Um, It's going to be a very tough uh, negotiation. So Europe will have to get its act together because no single country, and definitely not European countries, can isolate themselves from a world in turmoil. So Mm -hmm. we have to join forces and we have to act in unity because um, geopolitical tension and conflicts will continue to be there and intensify um, because uh, we will have to stand the tide of refugees as they will continue to keep knock on European doors. Um, we will have to decisively defeat terrorists as they will not hesitate to attack us or European cities, uh, cities again. Uh, so there is so much work to do in the interest 
and the freedom and security of the European citizens that Europe cannot afford to to um, to um, not be present um, in this very competing but also contested and complex world. But at world. the same time, you are distracted by the, by the aftermath of the, the UK vote and, and the, the internal tensions within you. And, yes. and to what degree is that hampering your ability to actually move forward in this security area as we see other dynamics taking shape? You know, as a defence minister, I consistently voiced the need for Europe to position itself as a convincing reliable and credible security provider, not even not, not just in its immediate region, but also uh, beyond. Again, time is running. Crises are out there. We are several wars, and so we have no time to lose um, and to get our act together. But you're absolutely right. As we speak, we are very distracted. It's disturbing me, uh, but we have to move on. I always think about Ban Ki-moon, who once said, cool hands will prevail. Uh, but cool hats at a certain point, cool hats will have to join forces in order to make the difference. Fascinating discussion. We do have to leave it. I know you yeah. two have, uh, yeah. both have engagements that you need to get to. So uh, I'd like to thank you both for joining us. Thank you for joining us here and making the trip over from the Congress Centre. And thank you, of course, for those of you watching online and, and via Facebook. This session is now over.